Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Joe Noriel, president of the Petaluma Museum. It's good to see you guys again. Uh, welcome to Flight, a tribute to aviation. Uh, very special guest today, you know, in the history of World War II. We can't forget, you know, the women really played a very, very important role in the war effort. Uh, so with that, we've got a great guest speaker today, uh, Jean Sloan, uh, excuse me, Jeannie Sloan, vice president of the Redwood Writers Club, a member of the Healdsburg Literary Guild, Military Writers Society of America and the Pacific Coast Air Museum. She was a tutor for the Adult Literacy Program. Ms. Sloan has published two historical fictions, She Flew Bombers, and the newly published She Built Ships During World War II, and those are available for sale uh, after the presentation. So with that, a very warm welcome, Jean Sloan. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Joe, and um, it's a lovely museum. We have a uh, museum in Healdsburg that is supposed to be like the Petaluma Sister Museum, I guess you'd call it. So I'm going to talk to you about the Women Air Force Service Pilots. And these amazing women flew planes from the factories to the bases during World War II so the men could fly them into combat. A lot of people ask me, are you a wasp? And I always answer, no, I'm too young to be a wasp. And then they want to know, well, how did you write about the wasps? Well, the war broke out, and my dad um, joined the Army. And he uh, married my mom on a weekend pass. And she got tired of waiting for him. This is the story they always told me. <laughs> And so she joined the Army. And she left me her scrapbook. It was about this thick. It had every single Army newsletter in it. And um, I got done looking through her scrapbook that even had ration coupons. And I realized, well, my mom typed for the colonel. And that was necessary, but nothing to write about but I found a tiny little article in one of her army base newsletters, as you can see. December 11th, 1943. Wax find wasps in barracks. Last Sunday, the wax awoke to find three wasps in the barracks. Yes, three members of the wasps were the guests of WAC Drive overnight on their way to deliver a plane to Atlanta, Georgia. These girls are women pilots who ferry planes from and to air bases. Although not part of the Army, they are subject to military discipline and regulations. They live in officer bachelor quarters, eat at OM, and wear officer pink slacks and shirts. At present, they are stationed at Wilmington, Delaware, and were very enthusiastic about tales of their experiences in the air. A salute to one of the other branches of the women's organizations doing their part to stop the Axis. Buy bonds. <laughs> and I thought, wow, I, I didn't know there were women pilots during World War II. I didn't think women did anything. And so I started doing research about the women Air Force um, pilots. And it took me three and a half years. And thus, I wrote a book about the pilots. Now, the <clears throat> many of the pilots started out, there were quite a few wasps that actually did barnstorming. And in my book, I have uh, the heroine of the uh, story. Now, this is a historical fiction. All the historical facts are accurate. I fictionalize the characters to give you an idea of what it was like to be a wasp during World War II. So the heroine of the story's name is Violet. Dad pulled out five $1 bills from the pocket of his well-worn coveralls for a ride in the JN-4 biplane. The deafening noise of the plane stopped 
as the pilot hauled himself out by pushing on the dark brown leather rim of the long oval cockpit. He threw one leg out, balancing between the tic-tac-toe maze of piano wires as he held onto the wood post between the wings to get his other leg out. Placing one foot in front of the other on the narrow metal strip on the bottom wing, he ducked the top wing and then jumped to the ground. Dad handed him the money as they shook hands. So Violet got to go up in a Curtis Jenny. I, in doing research for this book, I really wanted to see a Curtis Jenny. Everywhere I went, I'd say, isn't there a Curtis Jenny around? I asked the Pacific Air Museum, I want to see a Curtis Jenny, I want to feel a Curtis Jenny. And they said, well, you have to keep it inside, you need a hangar. And finally, somebody told me there was one at the Sonoma Valley Airport. And I got the opportunity to go up in a World War I Curtis Jenny. And it is truly amazing. I found out later there's only 10 airborne. It makes an incredible noise like three old tractors. <laughs> and it's open cockpit, and there's nothing like being in an open cockpit airplane. And that's me in the Curtis Jenny. You can't really see me in there, but I am. <laughs> so many of the women pilots got to practice flying in Curtis Jennies. But the Piper Cub, the J3 Piper Cub, was very typical of learning how to fly. At long last, my flying hour had arrived. I got on a bus in front of the cannery. I had told the bus driver where I was going, but watched intensely out the window so he wouldn't pass my stop. There up ahead was a large wooden sign announcing in black lettering, San Jose Municipal Airport. With the American flag flapping above it, my heartbeat sped up as the bus driver announced the stop. Getting off, I saw a small office building, but could only stand in front of it, trying to get up the courage to go inside. I talked myself into it, remembering the glorious feeling of my flight in the Jenny. I took a deep breath, went up the steps, and pulled open the heavy office door. A man with very thick, wavy, light brown hair that looked younger than Dad was behind the counter. He said, can I help you, young lady? I, I'm here for flying lessons, I said, looking everywhere but in his eyes. He looked me up and down, saying, how old are you, and do you have any money? I wound one of my blonde, blonde pigtails around my finger and nervously answered, I'm six, 17, and I've been saving up for lessons. The way he had asked and looked at me, I could tell he thought I was younger. Well then, have you ever been up in an airplane? I answered with as much confidence as I could. I've been in a Curtis Jenny a few times and I've always wanted to learn to fly. Well then, my name is Mr. Schelling and if you have four dollars, I'll be happy to give you your first lesson. He sounded more reassured this time. I had trouble opening the latch of my black suede bag with shaking fingers, I reached into the attached coin purse and presented him with the money. Here, fill this paperwork. That'll document your flying hours. 35 hours will get you your license. I read over the paper carefully and then filled it out on the dark wooden counter. After turning the papers in, Mr. Schelling scanned them over. Okay, Miss Willie. You can put your things in that locker over there, then follow me out to the hangar. We entered the semicircular metal hangar with a sign covering the front saying, Shelling Flying Service. Mr. Shelling began his lecture as he put his hands in his brown overalls. This is a Piper J3 Cub. It's 22 feet long and stands almost seven feet tall it has a Lycoming 65 horsepower engine, can attain a maximum speed of 85 miles per hour with a ceiling of 93,000 feet. 
The fuel tank holds 12 gallons, which is sufficient to fly four hours. There have been about 3,000 of these honeys built already. While my instructor, just the sound of it gave me a tingle of pleasure, talked to me about the Piper Cub, I started comparing it to the only plane I had flown in. The Curtis Jenny was five feet longer. The Cub could go 10 miles per hour faster, which I was really looking forward to. I wonder how many gallons the Jenny held. Maybe I could find out the next time I met up with the barnstormer. The Jenny was a biplane, whereas the Piper Cub only had one set of wings. At least the Cub had brakes, unlike the Jenny, which only had a tail skitter to stop it. The color of the Piper Cub really struck me, canary yellow, how marvelous. The Jenny was basically army olive drab and had heavy crisscross cable wires running at all different angles a meticulously rigged maze between two wings and the spruce wood struts. The cub, on the other hand, was a neater package. I suddenly realized I was not paying attention to Mr. Schelling, but got caught up in my own thoughts. I quickly straightened up my posture, which Mother was always reminding me to do. Are you ready for your first lesson, Miss Willie? The director of the um, Women Air Force Service Pilots was Jacqueline Cochran, and she convinced the President, General Hap Palmer, and Mrs. Roosevelt to establish the Women Air Force Service Pilots, which began at the end of 1942. They were paid by civil service and were not paid by the military, and had had to follow military rules, but had no military status whatsoever. The ways that um, young women found out about how to join the WASPs was interesting. Um, a typical way was the cover of Life magazine, which I just adore. And what I discovered, the museum has the original Life magazine around the corner. Everybody will have to see that. And I just love this photograph because the um, young uh, wasp has beautiful pigtails, which was very common back then to keep the, um, their hair in order when they were up in their open cockpit planes. And another... Um, I, what I was very amazed about were that 25,000 young women applied to the WASPs. And my first thought was, that many women had pilot's licenses in the 40s? And in further doing research, I found out that the president established civil pilot training classes in every state in the United States worrying about the impending war, and these classes did allow women in, in them. And so this is how 25,000 young women obtained their um, pilot's license, which cost $40 at the time. 1,830 women entered, and 1,074 graduated. Welcome class to the first civil training pilot program at San Jose State, said Mr. Reed. We can thank the great President Roosevelt for signing a proposal to provide pilot training to 20,000 college students around the nation. Our program includes providing a Piper J3 Cub for every 10 students. You will have 72 hours of ground school followed by 35 hours of flight training. At our college, we're very proud to offer this class. But you may hear some controversy. In the newspaper, there was an article saying it was a New Deal pork barrel waste of tax dollars. I just wanted to make you aware of this, since the college vehemently defends this course, as it will provide, provide a large base of trained pilots in case the war enlarges. 
Are there any questions so far? Mr. Reed unbuttoned the top button under his tie. Jacqueline Cochran, the, dire the director of the WASPs, she um, passed away in 1980. In 1938, she was the best female pilot. She set a new transcontinental speed record, and she was the first woman to break the sound barrier, as Chuck Yeager did. <clears throat> so, Violet read in the local newspaper, wanted women to deliver planes for the Army, civil service status, trained by military personnel, minimum age 18 to 28 years old, must be at least 5 feet 2, 120 pounds, high school diploma, private or commercial pilot's license, minimum 35 hours, pay 3,000 a year, release a man pilot for combat duty, physical exam required, and send letter and qualifications to Jacqueline Cochran, Director, Women's Air Force Service Pilots, Avenger Field, Sweetwater, Texas. There were several um, African American women that applied to the WASP that were able to get their pilot's licenses. And I will uh, read you a little bit about what that was like. And this was um, one uh, young black American that applied. After settling into our room, I handed her the change from the room fee, and she shyly said, Thank you, ma'am. Her eyes widened as I had never in my life been called ma'am before. How'd you learn to fly, she asked in a warmer tone. Just the word flying got me in a conversational mood. The first time I went up in a Curtis Jenny was when I was seven with my father, and he spotted a barnstormer flying over our farmhouse. I smoothed out the elaborate lacy bedspread and then sat down smiling as I recalled the memory. Well, I'll be. The first time I went up was also in a Jenny. I flew with the famous aviatrix, Bessie Coleman, the first Negro female barnstormer in 1925. And there's a poster of Bessie around the corner there. She's, she started her own flying school in Orlando, Florida, which is where I got my pilot's license. If it hadn't been for Bessie's school, I wouldn't have ever dreamed of signing up for the WASPs. The next morning, the physical exam was held in a hotel where there seemed to be thousands of men in all states of undress, which caused my heart to beat faster. I started feeling out of place as I pulled out my wrinkled plaid skirt and pinned back my pigtails to look older. I also worried about my newly fashioned double heeled shoes. When it was my turn to stand on the scale, I felt ill as the army flight surgeon slid the bar. Well, you barely made it. You sure are a skinny little thing, he said with his hands on his hips. Oh, I said with a relieved blush. I've been dieting for my boyfriend, I lied. Now take off your shoes and stand against the measuring tape on the wall, he pointed. Oh no, I thought, how stupid of me. Of course they didn't measure you with your shoes on. I reluctantly took off my double glued on loafer heels and stood as high as I could against the wall. Hmm, he muttered while narrowing his eyes at me. I'm very reluctant to sign your physical. You scarcely made the height or weight, and you aren't even 21 years old yet. You know, young lady, I don't think women should be in the military. Sir, 
The wasps are never involved in combat and simply help our men by ferrying aircraft from the factories to the bases to relieve them overseas. He frowned and shook his head, but all that mattered to me is that he signed the physical form. As I sat face to face with the legendary aviatrix, I mustered up courage from the bottom of my soul and focused on my great ability to fly. She looked so refined in her expensive black and white striped worsted suit. The suit was tailored like a man's suit with wide lapels and big black buttons. Her satin blouse added a soft feminine flavor to her outfit, along with her dainty diamond earrings that sparkled when she talked. Her lips were voluptuous like a Hollywood movie star's, but then maybe it was the dark red color that made them appear this way. Here's my pilot's license and logbook, Director Cochran, I said, presenting it to her. She scanned it over. Tell me, Miss Willie, why do you want to fly for the United States Army? I'm a fast learner, have a passion for flying, and I want to serve my country. I said, pulling at my skirt hem. The director handed me back my records, looked past me and said, next. I saw her jot something down in her notebook as I turned and anxiously walked back to the waiting room. When I saw Janet get up to be interviewed, I decided to sit back down close to the interview room. I saw Janet's hand tremble as she presented her logbook to, director, to the director. I see you attended Bessie Coleman's flying school, Mrs. Cochran said with admiration in her voice. Yes, ma'am, Janet said. She held her hands and squeezed them on her lap. Well, Miss Harmon, you are qualified to join the service pilots, but I must tell you we're not set up to have Negroes in separate barracks or have separate dining tables. The main problem is this job requires ferrying planes all over the United States, and I would greatly worry about your safety of even being able to get hotel rooms between bases. I have great respect for your instructor, Miss Coleman. Please give her my regards, but I am sorry to say I cannot accept you. If only we were not in a time of forced segregation, which I do not support, I would welcome you into our service. I am truly sorry and wish you luck. Mrs. Cochran held her hand down. Thank you, ma'am. Janet returned her handshake, then walked quickly past me before I could stop to talk to her. Thus began Violet's training and basic training was held in uh, Sweetwater, Texas, which was a very dusty, dry, desolate place. It was interesting, the pilots would get together and you think they would talk about flying. All they'd talk about was Texas. It seemed like hardly anybody was from Texas. They talked about the scorpions, the wolves, uh, the dust storms, and not about flying. This is what I read. <laughs> so, Director Cochran began her lecture. Ladies, here is your schedule. Oh, 600 hours is Reveille. Oh, 700 hours begins ground school. You will have the following classes. Physics, meteorology, maps, navigation, math, Morse code, military law, study of firearms, flight theory, instruments and mechanics. At 1330 hours, report to the flight line where you will begin to learn on our primary trainers or PT-19s. I know you're all pilots, but you're here to learn to fly the Army way. And let me tell you, our planes are not little joyride airplanes like I'm sure most of you hobbyists are used to. We all stood up straighter and kept our mouths shut. At 1900 hours is chow, then study time. 
Lights out is 2200 hours sharp. Every Saturday is white glove inspection. Director Cochran continued. Before beginning ground school, you will return to your barracks to find the only uniform the Army is able to provide. You now have exactly 30 minutes to try them on and then report to the infirmary for your shots. I glanced over at May. She had the same fearful expression on her face as I did on mine. The director's speech ended abruptly as she marched off, lightly flipping her hairdo. Back at the barracks, we had a grand old time trying on the so-called uniforms. See? <laughs> the wasps got surplus men's large size 44. Those were their uniforms. Is that amazing? Back at the... <clears throat> Which size do you want, shrimp? Large or large, teased Lana, as we tried on the surplus Army Air Force GI mechanic coveralls. Why, Violet, honey child, you're all swimming in them. May laughed, because she was almost as tall as Lana. You look a little better than I do, May and Lana. The size 44 men's large may put the crotch down to your thighs, but on me it goes to my knees. Look, the breast pocket's on my hip. I laughed so hard it led to a coughing fit. The olive drab tent cloth faded flight coveralls were almost all two sizes big for each of us. Yippee, here's the belts. Maybe they'll help. Adele flapped them around, hysterically laughing. Hey, May Lee, these are so big, I bet two of us could fit in one, I shouted out among all the laughter. Petite May Lee, always ready for a joke, got into my coveralls, and we both paraded around as we bent over and wiggled our bottoms. Lana May and Adele cinched up the huge baggy Harlem-like zoot suits, twirling and modeling while all the gals busted up laughing. I rolled them up and rolled them up, finally finding my hands and shoes. The suit flowed into a shapeless mass around my five feet, 108 pound frame. The crotch was at my knees with the shoulder seams hung over my elbows. Thank goodness there was a belt. And I had read that over and over in all the readings I had done. They would say over and over, thank goodness there was a belt, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> Another uh, part of ground school was learning the link trainer, which I'm sure that we have pilots here. You're familiar with what the link trainer is. A lot of discussion was about the link trainer during uh, basic training. A few weeks later, I lay awake going over all the instruments we had been working on in my mind. I knew by learning in the link trainer, I could fly in any weather and even at night. I was just about to drift off saying to myself over and over, trust in the instruments, trust in the instruments, when I heard Rosemary next to me mumbling, unlock controls, push rudder, thrust stick, I was glad not to be the only one keyed up and obsessed with the next day's test in the link trainer. We all had to have 19 hours of training in this little box, which had stubby little wings and a tail. It simulated flying, so we could safely practice before going up in a real airplane under any conditions. The link trainer was painted canary yellow was this a cruel joke for us trainees so we could pretend it was a Piper Cub? I just want to fly, I said to Lana in the classroom. I'm getting sick of this toy airplane that never lifts off the ground. I bit on my pencil. I'm with you on that one, Violet. Instrument flying is an unnatural act, probably punishable by God. It's a claustrophobic torture chamber, Adele whined. 
God almighty, you two, stop your belly aching. We've had one month to learn over 50 instruments on the link trainer, and if we trust in the instruments, we can ferry the biggies through the wild blue yonder blindfolded. Lana illustrated her exasperation by shuffling her notes together roughly. The civilian instructor, Red Timberton, shouted, Violet, you're up. I had never seen red hair before. I had seen red hair before, but not flaming red, as his hair was so red it looked like it was on fire. I tried not to gape at him. Yes, sir, I said, as I walked to the front of the classroom, where I accidentally bumped into one of the desks before getting into the flight simulator. With the recording pen hooked up, I put on the earphones. The black hooded canvas was over my head, and I proceeded to sweat in the hot box, waiting for instructions. Using only the instruments, I manipulated the controls, causing the box to rotate on its pivot. Overrule the brain and trust in the instruments, I mumbled to myself. Instructor Timberton controlled the turbulence or wind force in any direction and the fuel gauge. Flaps, Red yelled as I frantically groped for them. I quickly found the circuit breaker and pulled it down. Landing gear. <clears throat> Blindly, I fumbled until I found the right knob. Half the time, I thought it was turning right when I was turning left, but I stuck with repeating to myself, trust in the instruments, which soothed me. I knew the test was over when the instructor shouted, Lana, you're up. I passed the link trainer test, mastering being under the hood, which made me proficient in locating any item in the cockpit without having to hunt for it. I was so relieved. Oh, now we gotta go back. <clears throat> That morning, after a fitful sleep, I marched out to the flight line with my usual two cushions in order to see out the window. I brought along my custom-made blocks that I had made in town to tie onto my Oxfords so that I could reach the pedals. It's true. <laughs> my heavy parachute pack banged against the back of my knees. Lieutenant Hockett gave me a sneer that made me feel even more insecure. When I first saw all six feet of him with his mean, narrow gray eyes, I optimistically gave him my biggest smile. All he did was shake his head while muttering to himself, aviation is a man's field. Why is this puny kid trying to fly a plane? Then he said to me, all you dames look alike with no figures in those men's coveralls. I took a breath of fresh air to calm myself down, knowing he certainly did not expect me to answer such a rude comment. He was so conceited he swaggered as he walked towards the PT-17 as I followed behind. With the brake set and the stick pulled back, he swung the propeller. As it came to life, he scrambled into the front seat. We bumped over the, rush, the rough ground. Oh, my. Um, wings dipping from side to side as we taxied out for takeoff. In the crowded air, a plane started coming directly at us. Lieutenant Hockett jerked the controls away from my hands and jammed the throttle wide open to pull above the oncoming plane. It passed so close under us as the cellu celluloid windows rattled violently. When I looked down to see what kind of airplane it was, he shot me a nasty look. I choked back the tears. I'm not a quitter, I thought. I'll give it all I got. I knew I dared not let my emotions get away from me. Men were dying every day in battles for the war. I had to swallow my failure and try again. After all, mother always said, practice makes perfect, even though she was talking about pies. 
I knew all of us wasps had to do better than the men or be scorned. Unfortunately, he was the typical male pilot with the attitude that I had heard about. I thought about Rosemary, worrying I might end up getting washed out like she did. Then he screamed at me through the Gosport tube. God damn it, watch your direction. He barked orders, grabbed the stick from me, knocking it back and forth as it banged against my knees. He swore and flew into a rage again, yelling, damn it, watch your airspeed. I was having so much trouble concentrating with all his abusive cursing. I maneuvered right before I heard him shout, seat belt, in my headphones as I felt myself slipping out of the plane. I instinctively pulled my parachute cord, remembering from class that it must be done at high altitude in order to land safely. Counting to a rapid 10, the chute fluttered open and I floated down towards the field. I probably would have enjoyed the joyful gliding experience more, except all I kept thinking was, I did have my seatbelt on, I did. I waited in the field for Lieutenant Hockett to pick me up. Then I noticed a few feet away from me in the grass lay the seat belt. After the, the lieutenant arrived, I managed to wipe my tears as he grumbled, damn mechanics never secured the belt to the seat. Get back in. I got in the cockpit and still had the single-minded dedication to make it through the check ride and not wash out. Towards the end of the check ride, Hockett took over even though I should have been the one learning. My eyes were full of tears and I tried not to show my emotions. Finally, we landed. One of the instructors said, where have you two been? The lieutenant jumped out, threw off his parachute and yelled in front of everyone, God damn dame doesn't know what she's doing. I got out feeling a hot flush on my cheeks. There was an entire male audience before me. I heard nasty snickering as one of the male pilots announced to his buddies, girls shouldn't be flying. Then they all burst into laughter as one of the mechanics said, no wonder she couldn't land it. Look at the size of her. I bet her dainty little feet can't even reach the pedals. Here's a um, BT-13, and unlike the uh, PT-19, the cockpit roof could slide shut. If you look closely, you can see the um, young woman pilot. Her hair is raising up into the air. I met instructor Bucker at the flight line the next day. He said with a grin, all right, Violet, you're up for solo. Those are quite the overalls. I can't even see your figure in them. He gave me the once over. I'm ready, I said, feeling uncomfortable about his staring. I was getting pretty tired of the officer's comments on our so-called uniforms. I looked away, adjusting my bulky pa parachute pack. I want you to fly two hours from Avenger Field and then return, he said, and then slipped his pen onto the clipboard. Yes, sir, I said, and climbed onto the wing to the cockpit with my blocks and cushions. In the pocket of my mechanic suit, I felt around for a compass and a watch. My map was attached to my knee with a rubber band so it wouldn't fly out of the open cockpit like it did once before. The other knee held a notepad and pencil. On the leg of my pants, I had placed a wide strip of white adhesive tape to jot down the takeoff and landing time in big pencil numbers. I was well prepared to pass my solo. I had calculated the speed, altitude, taken into account the wind direction, and checked the weather report for the conditions of the day. For good luck, I had on my string of pearls. Up I went into the PT-19. It was glorious, fast, strong, and powerful. I looked at my map each time. 
I passed a checkpoint, then glanced at my watch to make sure I was passing each one on time. My first problem was I couldn't find the train tracks that were clearly mar marked on my map. Relax, relax, I told myself, as I knew tension and anxiety led to accidents. As soon as I spotted a familiar town, the marvelous feeling of flying drifted around me. I filled my lungs with air, breathing deeply while enjoying the wispy cirrus clouds high above. I enjoyed watching the shadow of my miniature twin PT-19 always at my side. If only I could find the railroad tracks, then I could follow them to the next town to be sure of where I was. The Texas sky was turning an ominous gray and a light rain started falling. I would be soaked before the flight was over. I wiped the drops off my goggles. The weather report was wrong and I certainly was fooled by how nice it had been at the beginning of the flight. I might have had the hours, but I was apprehensive because I had only flown in good weather. It was easy to get lost without mountain peaks or ranges to follow like those in California. Flying across the Midwest was harder to navigate because the landscape was so flat and never ending. The map didn't have enough landmarks, just the squiggly contour lines for hills. I buzzed the railway, railway station to read the name of the town, located it on the map, and then was able to draw a new course to my destination. Once the weather cleared, I was overjoyed to know where I was, so I started practicing my loops, chandelles, and pylong eights. I just loved how handy some of these aerobatics could help me change directions more quickly. Shooting up into the air, I made a beautiful loop. I was concentrating so hard, trying to master the exact precision of the move, that when I was done with my aerobatics, I lost my markers back to the home base. As I flew in each direction looking for a familiar landmark without success, I began to feel foolish that I had wasted so much time as I only had two hours left on my fuel tank. Just as panic began to set in, Lana flew reassuringly into view. She saved me as I followed her on a steady westward course. I gave her the thumbs up for a thank you. Then I remembered what my instructor had told me in college. Flying is the second greatest thrill known to man. Landing is the first. I was definitely looking forward to landing. Suddenly, I was starving. I reached down in my knee pocket and pulled out a squishy peanut butter and jelly sandwich and wolfed it down. At last, the checkpoints were exactly like the map, and I'd make it safely back and on time. Since there was no radio, I had to land when the green light pointed at my plane. Congratulations, Instructor Bucker said as he thrust out his hand. You've passed your solo. Thank you, Mr. Bucker. I pumped his hand enthusiastic. Lana May, Adele, and May Lee greeted me with a hip, hip hooray. We all marched off to the wishing well where they grabbed my arms and legs and threw me in, my braids flying behind me. I retrieved a lucky penny, feeling wonderfully satisfied with my latest accomplishment. I was soaking wet, but it felt so marvelous in the humid, sticky heat. And there's a uh, wasp who uh, got thrown into the wishing well. That was a really big deal after you soloed to be thrown into the wishing well. There's the women marching around the, the wishing well. Now, not only did the uh, women ferry planes for uh, the army so the men could fly into combat, they had another job. They um, did tow targeting. How many people here know what tow targeting is? Most people, yes, okay. So here's a letter which is a true story about um, tow targeting. Towing target sleeves for the gunnery crews has proved to be quite thrilling and it really stretches my skill as a pilot. 
Every day, I fly an A24 with a 30-foot long muslin sleeve at the end of 1,500 feet of steel cable. Army soldiers on the ground shoot off round after round of practice gunfire at the long piece of cloth that trails behind me. I really enjoy working with these two privates, Arnie and Lee. They are a gas. Arnie shoots yellow wax bullets and Lee shoots blue. After they signal me down, they count the colored holes in the sleeve and pony up bets to see who shot the most. They are always so complimentary about my flying. I love doing it. Arnie especially is a hot looker with short brown wavy hair and thick eyebrows and the dreamiest blue eyes. It's his smile that really gets to me. The other day, I was starting to feel very confident in my flying ability, keeping my eyes straight ahead, knowing one wrong turn and I could be shot at when I felt a burning sensation in my foot. I made an emergency landing after realizing a bullet had caught my left big toe. The crew which did not include Arnie and Lee this time, rode out to where I landed and started screaming at me. Why the hell did you land so suddenly, Lana? I shrieked back at all of them. You shot my goddamn toe, you idiots! They were pretty quiet as they helped me hobble into the Jeep, then drove me off to the infirmary I had the medic save the bullet for me and was able to get a local jeweler to make a necklace out of it. <laughs> that was toe targeting, which was really kind of a dangerous job, but this is how the men practice their shooting. And the uh, women had to learn how to fly in formation 500 feet apart. There they are in their warm outfit when it got cold. In order to uh, learn to fly bombers, they had to go to four weeks of uh, bomber school. In order to learn to fly pursuits, they then had to go to um, four weeks of uh, pursuit school. This was a P-51 at the Sonoma County Airport. There was a uh, special <coughs> events day where um, there were a few pursuits and bombers. And uh, this was a bomber, which was very exciting for me to go inside a bomber. They, they are so incredibly huge. Um, and um, a few people got to fly in the bomber. Um, what, what happened to the... Um, 38 pilots died in the Women Air Force Service pilots, and they never left the United States. There were two cases of documented sabotage, grass in the fuel tank, water in the fuel tank. And um, this is Hazel Lee. Two Chinese American women joined the WASPs, and she died in a mid-air collision in 44. 407 women were injured. Maggie G is another um, Chinese American pilot, and last year a uh, children's book was written about her that I thought that I would bring. She lives in Berkeley, and she is still alive. She became a, physis, a physicist after the WASP disbanded and attended um, UC Berkeley and worked at Lawrence Livermore Lab. And um, in 1950, she actually joined the Army. Uh, but this is a beautiful children's book, if anybody would like to look at it afterwards. Well, I wanted to, yes, here's the Soviet Night Witches. I brought a few books about the Soviet Night Witches, and uh, this is the last part of my presentation. 
the P-39 Aracobra at the Niagara Falls factory had a red star painted on it for the Russians, and several of us got the privilege of delivering them to Great Falls, Montana for the government Lend-Lease program. I trampled in the snow towards the Russians' plane. The two Soviet women pilots climbed from their aircraft. I reached out my hand to the first one. Hello, I'm Violet Willie. I'm here delivering a pursuit for the Lend-Lease program. Lieutenant Lydia Levikov, my co-pilot, Sonia Bursova, 588th Night Bomber Regiment. Thank you for your services, she said in a thick Russian accent. We shook hands as I looked out towards their plane. What type of airplane are you flying? Come, the lieutenant said as she gestured me towards her plane. This is a PO2. It was designed in 1927, and the beauty of the plane, it is capable of descending on any landscape. It reminds me so much of the first airplane I flew in as a young girl, I said nostalgically. How so? the lieutenant asked. It's made of fabric and wood, I said, feeling the wing affectionately. Yes, that's her downfall. It's a fire hazard in combat, and the fuel tanks are not shielded, so it is very vulnerable to being set on fire if hit. At least it can carry two 1,200-pound bombs and does have a machine gun in the rear cockpit, Lydia said proudly. With my gloved hand, I felt one of the white roses painted on the side of the PO2. I smiled, glancing at the pilots. Lieutenant Levikoff looked pleased that I had noticed them. Those are for my hits. I am called the White Rose of Stalingrad, she said. Hits? I asked, full of surprise. She put her hands on her hips. Each of these roses signifies my successes in bombing the Nazis. Oh, I said meekly, women aren't allowed to serve in combat here in America. But I know now, despite what the men say, women can obviously be quite an asset to this war. A gust of wind came off the snow-capped mountains, causing me to shiver. But I noticed it did not faze these tough young Soviet women. The Soviet night witches, there were 400 women pilots. They flew 23,000, that should be 1,000, <laughs> combat missions, 15 to 18 a night. 30 died in service, and they flew 1,100 nights of combat. In 1990, 50 wasps went to visit the Soviet night witches. The um, Jackie Cochran presented a bill to give military status to the WASPs, and it was defeated in June 1944 because the men were starting to come back from the war. The House Committee on Civil Service reported that training would be wasteful, and therefore the WASPs were deactivated December 44 eight months before the end of the war, and they were very devastated not to be able to, send, to celebrate the end of the war with their classmates. It was a very depressing time for the WASP to be kicked out, shall we say. They flew 77 types of airplanes, 60, 60 million miles, and they delivered 12,652 planes. Another interesting fact, um, they uh, did not gain military status until they gathered together after hearing in 1972 that um, there was an announcement that women were flying and joining the Air Force for the first time, and they all gathered together to say, that's not true, that's the second time. And um, it took 
until July 09, Obama signed a um, for them to receive the Congressional Gold Medal. They did um, receive military status in uh, uh, 1977, and what that meant is they were able to um, be able to go to veteran hospitals to be buried in the uh, veteran uh, cemeteries, but they, of course, didn't receive the GI Bill. Um, so Obama signed uh, for them to get a, a gold medal um, 60 years later. Oh. oh, I have to go back. And uh, they received the gold, the Congressional Gold Medal. I hope you heard it on the radio. It was all over the news and in the radio. Um, they received the gold medal March of uh, 2010. 200 women received the medal. And um, they say there's 300 uh, presently alive. When I asked, uh, this, by the way, is Florence Wheeler. She's a wasp. She lives in Healdsburg. Um, when I asked Florence, I said, Florence, are you going to fly to Washington to receive the gold medal? And she said, well, I'd like to. And I said, are they going to pay for your trip there? And she said, no. And I said, are they going to pay for you to stay there? And she said, no. And I said, that's terrible. And she said, this is nothing new. <laughs> And I thought, yeah, I guess uh, it'd be nice to get the medal, but it is quite an expense. <laughs> that was an interesting conversation we had. I had to share that with you. And uh, these are twins. One joined the Air Force, and the other became the first commercial woman pilot in 1972 for Frontier Airlines, Emily Warner. And that's how long it took after the women were uh, disbanded, uh, they applied to become commercial pilots. They were turned down and told to apply to become stewardesses. And they were certainly capable. But it took until 1972 for the first woman commercial pilot. And um, after we have a question time. I'm happy to um, uh, autograph my book for you if you'd like to uh, purchase it. I also um, uh, was given a grant on I gather, was able to gather six former women pilots together at the Santa Rosa Vets building. I wrote and emailed, email was kind of useless, um, to every WASP in California, Oregon, and Washington, and I was able to gather six women pilots, and we gathered at the Santa Rosa Vets building, and much to my surprise, there was standing room only. There were that many people interested in hearing their oral history, and a DVD was made, and the women talk about what it was like to be um, women pilots. I have since um, published a new book, um, she built ships during World War II, and it's about women welders, uh, riveters, about the Japanese-American internment in the Tanferan horse stables in San Bruno, the Tuskegee Airmen, and the Port Chicago explosion. It, I do have a PowerPoint presentation of uh, these events. If anybody's interested in having me come to any club or organization, I'm happy to do a presentation on either of these pieces of history. So um, does anybody have any questions at this point? 1619, I can't remember. Oh, is that what I'm wearing? Uh, the Stearman. I know, but the 17, we flew, but I'm, I'm trying to think what It's an uh, open cockpit. It has covers on top? Uh, no, no. And I um, went to the Sonoma County the Sonoma Valley Airport, and I uh, was able to um, experience aerobatics in this airplane. 
so I could write about what it was like. Uh, in uh, 1942 Stearman, no, no. Okay. a PT-17, yes, yes. The yeah, and um, I would never do it again. It was so frightening. <laughs> <laughs> I was really, I was excited. I thought it would be fun, just like I had been in the Curtis Jenny, which I thought was a blast, but oh, it was so confusing to be going upside down and all around, and I mean, before I got in, the pilot said to me, Oh, I see you have a camera. Make sure you take lots of pictures. Well, I held on to that leather rim, and I put that camera in my seatbelt. And they put a parachute on me even. And I, there's no way I'd even know how to use the parachute. They, they didn't, don't. They didn't. They didn't, didn't how to, no. Uh, did you have to use it? How no. To, how to pull the D in? No, because it was um, open cockpit besides. I just held on to that leather rim <laughs> and... You know, and he gave me, you know, it was Cuban 8s, and uh, I, I wrote down everything I did. Not did you have two sets of seatbelts? Um, they were special seatbelts. You so know, it isn't a, like this. It's usually uh, shoulder harness and Yeah, belt. it was a shoulder and then, and then harness. Then yeah. And I got to do a, um, a loop, a barrel roll, a hammerhead, and a Cuban 8. It was really scary. But I've been told it's more fun to be the pilot and do the aerobatics oh, yeah. than to be the passenger. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other um, questions? Yes? In uh, doing your research, have you ever come across a rumored Jacqueline Cochran actually did fly a combat Okay, so this is what I found because people ask me a lot. She flew a group of women one time over the hump, they call it, overseas, just to prove they could do it. But that's it, just one time. Now, the, um, the wasps stayed in the United States. But like I said, 38 died in the United States. Why? Well, they're, the two acts of sabotage, but basically they were test pilots. Planes were being churned out like crazy. And sometimes a wing was not riveted properly and would fall off. But there was a war going on. And uh, not much was done with the casualties, including the two documented acts of sabotage, which I've read. Are there any other uh, questions at all? Thank you. Oh, Thank you're you. welcome. And you're welcome to um, mm -hmm. take a free bookmark, uh, look at a yearbook from 1944 and the children's book and the Soviet Night Witches. So come and look at the memorabilia I brought. <laughs>